My name is John. My apartment is modern, mostly glass, and looks out at the city and the river. In summer, I keep my balcony door open more often than not. I never expect a visitor to enter that way as I'm 12 stories up, so you can imagine my surprise when this past June, a large green parrot flew in and landed on my breakfast table. He seemed quite comfortable there and looked me in the eye. I didn't quite know what to do. Tropical birds are not indigenous to Brooklyn. I settled on talking to my doorman. My doorman is a fellow named Jamel, and he heard me out. What do you want me to do, he asked. Reasonable question. I thought maybe Gio, the superintendent, might come up and remove the bird. Jamel expressed reservations, but called Gio, and together the three of us went up. It was anticlimactic. The parrot was gone. Jamel and Gio went out on my terrace, looked around. Nothing. So, chagrined, I thanked them both and went on with my day. The next morning, the parrot returned. I was a bit relieved and, by way of proof, took a picture of him with my phone. The bird didn't seem to mind. I remember that I had a container of unsalted nuts in my cupboard and spilled some onto the table. The parrot ate a few and threw the rest on the floor, which made me laugh. To my amazement, the parrot laughed at me in return, and it was an eerie version of my laugh. A new thought came to me. Maybe I should keep this parrot? I'd been a bit lonely lately. It was nice to share my morning with this exotic green presence. He was very beautiful. Just then there was a knock on my door. The knock had a tentative quality. It was a knock that said I probably shouldn't knock. When I opened the door, there stood a tall woman with a boyish haircut. She was dressed in a gray off-the-shoulder thing, spoke quietly, and had a serious expression, and asked if I had by any chance seen a parrot. I stood aside so that she could see my guest. Her face lit up and she exclaimed, Max! She had an accent. Was she from Belgium? I asked. No, Sweden. That's how we started talking, Tina and I. Her husband had forgotten to trim Max's flight feathers, and the bird had taken advantage of his newfound mobility to visit me. Mine was the next balcony, and I guess he wondered how the other half lived. I offered Tina some coffee, but she declined. Her husband would be home soon, and would wonder at the simultaneous absence of his wife and her parrot. Then she was gone. I noticed a faint sadness rise in me. I guess I'd like the idea of having a parrot. Or company, anyway. Two days later, there was another knock on the door. It was Tina, and she had a tin of decaf coffee. She explained that she didn't drink decaf. She bought it by mistake, and perhaps I'd like it. I said, sure, and invited her in. She seemed uncertain, and then said no. She had chores to do. I asked after the parrot. She said Max was fine. Her husband had trimmed the flight feathers, and I should get no more visits. Then I offered... Then perhaps she'll allow me to visit him sometime. I liked seeing him. That seemed to surprise her. Yes, she nodded, biting her lips slightly, doing some silent calculation. Could I come Friday at noon? I said I could. She seemed quietly stunned, turned bright red, and left. On Friday, I went to Tina's apartment. Max was gripping a long perch, rocking from side to side. Tina served coffee and macaroons, and we chatted blandly. At a certain point, she excused herself briefly. In that pause, Max leaned forward and whispered, John, dear John. He whispered it with surprising tenderness and in Tina's voice. When Tina came back into the living room, I looked from Max to her, and now it was my face that was bright red. Had Tina been saying my name when I wasn't around? And adding, dear? It got awkward after that. When we crossed paths in the hallway of the lobby, we spoke at the same time or not at all. I started listening at my door before I opened it. If I heard activity, I waited for silence. We stopped running into each other. On the 4th of July, I poured myself a drink and went out to the terrace to watch the fireworks. They hadn't started yet. While I was sipping my drink, I saw Tina come out on her balcony. 
She didn't look at me, acted unaware, and quickly hung a white satin slip from a hook to dry. As twilight came on, I could watch Tina's slip catch the breeze and flutter. Did she know I'd imagine her in it? Imagine her long legs, her boyish haircut, her soft Germanic voice calling my name, calling me dear. I couldn't make up my mind if I was miserable or elated. The next morning, the slip was gone, and I was relieved and disappointed. Who was her husband, anyway? Why couldn't she be single? I made coffee and sat on the terrace to read the paper. I forced myself not to look over at Tina's terrace again. Gradually, my attention really did migrate to an article reporting the shenanigans of a local official. That's when I heard it. John, dear. It looked over. I looked over. It was Max. He'd managed to flutter up to my neighbor's railing, and he was looking at me. I lost it. I told the bird to shut up. I called him an ugly buzzard. I told him I was sorry he'd ever come to my apartment. That I hoped he'd die. And then Tina came out. She was wearing the slip. She had the most remarkable eyes. Liquid and compassionate. I knew she understood my outburst for what it was. Without a word, I got up, walked down the hall, knocked. She let me in. We kissed. I said, you know, I don't even drink decaf. She laughed. Max laughed after her, a perfect imitation. After we made love, I asked her if she found it cruel to clip her parrot's flight feathers. She explained that her husband attended to that. She found it too stressful. To be honest, when her husband performed the task, she couldn't watch. She felt he was doing it to her. I stroked her hair. It was soft and short. I said, the good news is those feathers grow back. And they did.